warm welcome to our month-long celebration of the Science Festival which will culminate into the Mars Orbital Mission. Over the past few weeks, we've been showing you various programs related to science exploration and research and its applications which concern you and me in day-to-day -day life. Today we are at the esteemed Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai which has played a pioneering role as far as the basic science research in the country is concerned. But when you talk about the basic science research, neutrino particle is one particle which has evoked a lot of interest amongst the scientists and the physicists across the world. But what exactly is this neutrino? Joining me now is an esteemed panel of guests. To my left is Professor Amol Dighe, who is from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. We have Professor Nabha K. Mandal, from, again from TIFR. Then we have Professor D. Indumati, who is from the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai. Professor Vivek Datar, who is from Bhava Atomic Research Center, Mumbai. And Professor Mohammad Naimuddin from Physics Department, University of Delhi. Welcome all of you on this special show on Rajya Sabha Television. I would like to begin with you, Professor uh, Mandel. I remember when we were in grade four and then we were studying about atom, it consisted of electrons, protons and neutrons. But when you talk about neutrino, is it, is it something which is an extension of all these three particles which we have studied? Well, I mean, it is to some extent an extension, but uh, what you have learned about proton, neutron and electron when you are in your you know, science class, and uh, the proton out of that, proton and neutron are really not fundamental particle in the sense electronic. Okay. So now we call quarks. We have up and down quarks and electron. And the neutrino is one such elementary particle. Okay. And, and actually it is just like an electron, but only thing is it doesn't have a charge. Okay. So, you know, there's the difference. But it is the, ba it is the latest fulcrum of excitement for the physicists and the scientists across the world. Why so? Um, well, it has to be because it is one of the most abundant particles in the universe. Okay. So, sun, for example, gives out lots of neutrinos. A, a trillion so, of when them you say abundant particle, we also have uh, photons which are in abundance. So, how would you really differentiate them? So, there are about half the number of neutrinos in the world as there are photons. Okay. 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 If you look at the sun, which is what we see every day, right. about 100 trillion neutrinos from the sun pass through each of us every second. Okay. okay. So, these are so abundant. But so, uh, so from what you're saying, I gather to understand that uh, uh, the scientists know what neutrino now is, what it is capable of, but probably you don't have the technology uh, to detect what, what it can really do to future? Uh, that's true. So we know about neutrinos, we know some of its properties, we still don't know some, for example, we don't know what its mass is. Okay. okay, but from whatever properties that we know, we can actually infer about where they come from, the stars, you know, for example, sun, what they do okay. in the sun. Okay. But still there are lots of things that we don't know about this. Right. And once we learn more about it, then we can think about what used to put it to more okay. and more. Okay. Uh, Professor Indumati, if I could uh, come to you. Field. Neutrino, what is the need for building an underground lab for neutrino when you particularly talk about that? So this has to do with actually not the neutrino itself, but uh, what other particles uh, we receive on Earth. Okay. Uh, earth has an atmosphere which blocks a lot of uh, particles coming on the Earth, but these, uh, this atmosphere is also responsible for creating also more particles on, on the surface of the okay. Earth. And if you just look at the number of cosmic rays, in fact the origin of these cosmic rays is still an open question in, in uh, particle physics today, but if you look at the number of cosmic rays reaching us, mm -hmm. and many of these are charged particles like protons and a, a kind of a partner or cousin of electron called the muon. So all these particles will just bombard the surface of the earth. Okay. But being charged, you know that the earth is like, uh, uh, you know, earth is like electrical neutral, right? Okay. So once these particles go through the earth, they get absorbed uh, so, over some so distances. Are you, are you saying that when, uh, when the cosmic rays fall and uh, the other particles are also traveling, so it's only the neutrinos which go underground exactly. and the other particles get filtered? You, you have Something absolutely like that? understood it. So in fact, the earth okay. acts as a filter. Okay. for these other particles. Okay. So, okay. because neutrinos are very weakly interacting, in fact, uh, Professor Daba Mandel already said they have no charge. Right. So, they cannot uh, uh, interact through their electric charges because right. they have none. Right? Right. So, they interact through a force which is called a weak force okay. and the name itself tells you that this force is very weak. Mm -hmm. So, they are very weakly interacting which is why all right. those trillions of neutrinos that Professor Dighe told you about right. coming from the sun go through you and don't do anything right. to you at all. Uh, right? uh, uh, Professor so. Dathar, uh, it's, it's something very interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a weak particle but at the same time it's called a ghostly particle you say it's a mysterious particle not much is known about it uh, uh, what is exactly i mean what lies at the core of this uh, particle why do people why do people really call it it's a ghostly uh, particle uh, ghostly and comes there's a lot, lot of apprehensions which have been spread uh, 
especially in India, you know, when when it comes yeah, to the mostly development. Mostly, it just comes about because it's hard to detect. So it okay. passes through you, right. and you don't know that it has passed through you. That's the ghostly aspect of it. But uh, the interest is, of course, because it is one of the least understood particles. It can probe, as you say, things which uh, we do not know things about. For instance, we did not know directly about 50 years ago that nuclear reactions were powering the sun. Okay. And it was through neutrinos that we came to definitively understand right. what is going on at the core of the sun. Right. So just as you have an image of the sun, which you can photograph, you can see. Uh, similarly, we have now an image of the sun in the neutrino spectrum. Mm -hmm. okay. you, that, that's a beautiful thing that has happened. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing is that long time. Long yeah, it takes a long time to make such a picture, but okay. it can be done. I mean, it has also it has poorer angular resolution than optical yeah. resolutions right. and so on. But right. still, at the level of technology, we at least can make an image right. of the sun in neutrinos. Uh, Professor okay. Naimithi, if I could uh, come to you. Uh, now, one question which comes to uh, uh, my mind as a layman uh, uh, would be that what can be the applications of neutrino, the immediate applications what, uh, what you just spoke to, uh, what you were talking about a short while from now? Well, uh, neutrinos directly, immediate application of neutrinos may not be the direct uh, application as of the moment but what do you do when you do any basic science for example in case of neutrino you have to detect these neutrinos so in order to detect these neutrinos as uh, many of our guests has already told you that it's a really weakly interacting particle so you have to develop good detector technologies so that you can detect this mysterious particle which is okay. least interacting and in order the detectors that you develop for detecting these particles right. has immediate societal applications. Right. Uh, but if I could just uh, button, uh, Professor Dattar, uh, when, when uh, Professor Naimidhi is talking about the detectors, uh, I am told that we are having a special iron calorimeter which is going to be placed inside that uh, observatory which is coming yeah. up underground in uh, Madurai. What is so special about that uh, detector really? Okay, this detector consists of a huge amount of iron which okay. is magnetized and this mag uh, iron is interspersed with so-called active detectors. They are gas detectors which tell you the position of the charged particle that goes through this detector. Okay. These charged particles are produced as a result of interactions of these ghostly particles okay. with the iron. So okay. the iron has two purposes. One is to provide for target nuclei with which it can interact right. and then produce secondary particles which can be detected by these gas detectors and also to provide a magnetic field. The iron is easy to magnetize. Right. Right. So ICAL will be actually when built the biggest magnet, electromagnet in the world. Okay. Okay. It will be a 50,000 ton magnet, mm -hmm. uh, consisting of three modules, of course, right. each of about 16, 17 right. kilotons. And uh, so these muons, which will be produced as when the muon type of neutrinos interact, right. which is what we are going to mainly measure, mm -hmm. they will uh, actually bend and depending, the bending will depend on the charge okay. because you can have either mu plus or mu minus, positively or negatively right. charged muons produced as a result of uh, neutrinos or anti-neutrinos in okay. and then they can be tracked. So one, uh, once this process is done, you can see the actual mapping happening somewhere, no? Yeah, you, you will have, you know, visual displays right. of these muons bending okay. and so on. Okay, yes. the, the in, entire path in X and Y planes, yes. Right. Right. In fact, I was uh, coming to you, uh, Professor Mandal, on this uh, INO project. Uh, uh, there have been a lot of reported delays protests, there were a lot of challenges in coming up with this entire INO project. Just take us through some of the challenges which you had to uh, undergo, I mean your uh, your uh, TIF uh, or rather your uh, truck with the government, the bureaucratic processes, the kind of delays you had to face as far as the environmental protests and all are concerned. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this in a different way. We had actually crossed many hurdles. Okay. So for example, I mean when we are looking for the INO site mm -hmm. and then we of course we, we need a site underground, so whom do you go? You go to the Geological Survey of India. Right. So they actually shortlisted some site for us and for example the current site is one of them. Now when you go and see that site, then immediately the local local population or the villagers, they will get suspicious. I mean, what are these people are coming at their backyard and talking some weird language like neutrinos and all those things they want to detect. Obviously, they will be suspicious and, uh, for us one. And then on top of that, when you do that, there are people also, they are, they are not from the local. They are coming from outside again and they are telling all, immediately we start talking about neutrino experiment, they will start talking all the bad things neutrinos can do to the human being. I program. remember having read it somewhere, if I am not wrong, you might correct me, Dr. Indamati. I was reading it that probably it's a source of some kind of a nuclear bomb or yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, okay, all those kind of myths were being spread about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually, 
so we, we actually took a sustained outreach program we talked to small groups of people large groups of people local people then what we did we went to the local colleges and universities and talked to the students there and the students they quickly can understand that uh, what we are doing what is the you know excitement about so, professor mandir when you embark on these kind of outreach programs yes. i'm sure it's not a very easy task because you got to convince the local people the students yes. who are interacting yes. how difficult really is so it, it? it especially is, when you're talking about a particle about which no one knows anything so it is it is i would say that it is a complex thing that we have to do it sustained way mm -hmm. but once you start seeing the result right. and it is really rewarding for right. example when you went to talk to the students first and they are got excited actually some of them got excited and it is actually easy because then students are talking to their parents who are the basically local people mm. and they get convinced about the importance of this science and finally what happens in 2010 the local collector the tenny collector he organized a meeting and that was attended by something like 2000 people okay. and uh, local people and we have to have to explain them every parts answer all the questions and after that was that, that was a kind of a victory rally yes, for neutrino at that course, point of time like that at the end of that rally <laughs> the collector announced that the local people are now convinced about okay. the usefulness of the project to be here uh, and we are there so it is a sustained project i mean but uh, what stage uh, is the, uh, the 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 observatory right now uh, at madurai so so this observatory is right now that government act. so our project is is funded by the two departments of science in this country that is the department of atomic energy and department of science and technology okay. so but uh, but the main uh, actually the piloting department is department of atomic energy so the our project we have been proposed the uh, given the proposal with all the funding required and it has to first approved by the planning commission and then it has gone to the what you call the atomic energy commission which right. is the, the complete project mm -hmm. in addition uh, because it is a, because the the department of atomic energy and department of science and technology is very serious about the project they has given us what you call the pre project funding okay. of the order of something like 86 crores of uh, rupees okay. to start the you know preliminary work there for But example when you talk about the pre project preparation it's like building the tunnel placing no, the no, no, detectors no no not building the tunnel all that. so all the r&d complete okay. the r&d of okay. the detector okay. def define what will be the parameters of your detector and then do some local development work in that place in the sense of fencing the area okay. and uh, making you know roads bringing the water because you know we have even promised okay. the local people that okay. we are not going to use your ground water mm -hmm. so we are bringing water from a river which is 15 kilometers away through pipeline right. all these work we are doing in this pre project fund but uh, uh, professor bk if i could ask you projects like these when they come up uh, especially in uh, natural habitats like uh, the one which is just coming up at the thenny district of tamil nadu uh, this ino uh, project uh, how can it really help the local people over there because a lot of tribal population lot of local people who are staying and who would be staying around the observatory how we will this project really help them uh, you have to look at two different things actually the schools in that place the colleges around it and the local population because the local population is not related either to the schools or the colleges right, right. so when you go there and and uh, ask their questions you know they are not questions that you or i would think of right i mean their questions are can i still graze my goat in your land okay okay so no we had a lot of learning to do actually in right. fact many of us who have been going there over the years no, so which means that they are still concerned about their livelihood uh, yes so but, i think uh, but will the project really cater to their livelihood no, so, what, so, what so that's what i said so so what i'm saying is we had to even find a meeting point first to understand each okay. other okay okay so okay. their questions were you know um, uh, we, we needed a culvert here we needed a street light there so it's at a very different level okay but one thing i think now they have all appreciated we said that look as a basic sciences project many of your children who are going to college can actually come and do a summer project with us okay, okay. and you know that they can understand that so is that's something a ray of you know hope you've held out so for the, the other, local people the other aspect right, of yeah. you know any big science project right, right. is that you invest a lot of money which has to be invested locally right you know because building the tunnel and all this kind of thing so it also brings employment for the local people right. Right. that's one of the spin off you can say because right. then you know there are a lot of tenders that only locals can do So, so of course it's a, it's a it's a very big challenge yeah. convincing the local people of uh, uh, whichever science project is coming up i'll have to take a short break here but when we come back we talk about other neutrino projects which are existing across the world back in a moment welcome back you're watching our special program from the tata institute of fundamental research mumbai uh professor mandal if i could uh, start uh, with you there are various uh, other neutrino projects in countries like italy japan which have made some kind of a forward movement so 
is there going to be some kind of a link with the project which India is going to come up and the ones which are really existing across the world? Yeah, surely. So, what is happening now, the neutrino is one of the most exciting area of research in particle physics today. As you have learned from other panelists today that, you know, there are, there are, we have learned new exciting things about neutrinos. The neutrinos have mass, they oscillate from one species to another, mm -hmm. things like that. So, in this process, we have to learn many of these, their properties uh, completely. So, for doing that one, there are many experiments are also being planned or already operational uh, in, uh, in elsewhere of the India. For example, there is an experiment going on in South Pole, in uh, below 1.5 kilometer of ice at um, the South Pole, oh. which is called Ice Cube. Okay. This detector is a kilometer cube detector in the okay. ice. Okay. And this detector is looking for neutrinos coming from astrophysical sources, so very what, high energy So neutrinos. what you mean to say that this, this one particular detector has been placed inside the ice cube, yes. one could be under the so sea no, and no, one could yeah. be underground there, like there, what the yeah. one is coming so up in this, India. So this experiment is addressing the issue that what are the sources of cosmic rays, what okay. are the sources of neutrinos. Okay. There are two experiments and actually three mm. in uh, France, in China, uh, in South Korea. Mm -hmm. These are looking for neutrinos coming from the nuclear reactors. Okay. Using that, they are studying some properties connected to the neutrino oscillation. Right. It's called the mixing angle. Okay. So they are determining that one. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the key questions that we still have to answer in the neutrino physics is that we know that neutrinos have masses. And we know there are three neutrinos, right? And uh, But we do not know which of these three neutrinos is the heaviest which one is the lightest. Okay. Okay. So, this question is called neutrino mass hierarchy. Neutrino mass hierarchy. But Professor Datar, if I could bring in you, uh, what uh, Professor Mandel is talking about. Are you really hopeful? Uh, of course, uh, th there's a word called leap of faith, which is very big in science. But with this INO project, which is coming up in India, are you really hopeful that you will be able, able to cater to all these uh, kind of requirements which you're actually looking at? Yeah, I mean, the detector that is being, uh, that will be built, mm -hmm. uh, will uh, hope to measure this uh, mass ordering okay. uh, of these new three uh, species uh, which are analogous. But, but, but why is it, there is, there is a confusing, confusing signal when you talk about the mass of neutrinos. Some say it's a zero mass thing, some say no it has a little mass well, you know which uh, is uh, which is measured in terms of uh, in, uh, EVs or I, I'm not too no. very clear but okay. in some kind so, of units so, it's measured. So we know cert certainly that uh, at least two masses are non-zero. Okay. Whether or not the third is zero, we don't yet okay. know. Okay. So okay. that has to so be detected. That has to be found out. Okay. But uh, right now, the question that is important is whether, as he said, uh, how are these three masses ordered? We know the ordering of two of them. Okay. We don't know whether the third one is higher than these two okay. or lower than these two. Okay. Because that difference is larger. Okay. So we don't know whether it's up, up here or down there. Okay. Now, that question is important because if you want to address another important question, which is even probably more fundamental, is that why is there a preponderance of matter? over antimatter in the right. universe at right. large. Right. That question, if it has to be answered, mm -hmm. we have to know an answer to this question as well, okay. at least in many of the experiments. So, uh, now, what you mean to say, does it have any relation with the Big Bang uh, theory? Uh, Professor Naimuddin, if I could bring in you. Yeah, so, so we know that at, from the Big Bang theory that uh, the current matter that we see around us in the universe, it's only about the 4%. Okay. And about 15 or 16 percent of that is the dark energy. So about 80 percent of the matter is missing. Okay. And we say that's that's a dark matter. Once this distinction distinction is complete between matter and antimatter, uh, what is the immediate application where you could actually apply this in terms of technology? Uh, because that is that is one question which comes to every every mind, and that is that you know where can you use that technology immediately? See, technology usually follows fundamental science results mm -hmm. after some time, no? maybe uh -huh. decades or maybe even centuries. Right. Uh, so right now, as you said, the, our main emphasis is to actually understand things and then see where they take us. Okay. Or as Naeem said some time back, that uh, the technologies that uh, come off as a spin-off for what you want to do. Right. Okay. However, I may like to say that there are certain kind of technologies that we do expect to develop in the next few decades which will be very important But when you talk uh, about us. the spin-offs, what are the kind of spin-offs you're talking about, the technological spin-offs? The kind of spin-off that already have come are, for example, in uh, medical imaging okay. uh, kind of techniques right. or uh, uh, Cherenkov even, even the accelerators, uh, imaging. Even the accelerators that we use right. for treating cancer, for example, right, right. Uh, it's a spin-off from basic science. Okay. So people who made the accelerator first, it's, it, they were not making the accelerator for some so application. Mm -hmm. They were trying to understand uh, if they can accelerate particles or not. 
okay. and that's how the accelerators came into existence okay. and now you can see the, see the uses almost every hospital right. has an accelerator right. so that's a that's like a spin off of basic research can okay. i put it a different way I mean, yeah i yeah, think yeah, the basic please. research comes first in right. the sense 100 years ago when the electron was discovered hmm. you didn't know to what use you could put it right okay. you didn't have i mean all our uh, conversation is being recorded through electronic equipment which needs these electrons to move and right. you need to understand their properties before you can hmm. apply them in hmm. any technology so i think that first we should understand that uh, this is a basic sciences project so we are still trying to understand the nature of this particle mm -hmm. and i think the best analogy is uh, the blind man with the elephant right <laughs> so all of us have seen different parts of the neutrino you know we we have seen you know somebody's felt the trunk somebody's felt the tail somebody's felt the ears and we don't know what kind of beast this is right. so the the question about the applications that's and technology that's, that's an excellent uh, uh, analogy which has been given to you uh, given by you but uh, professor dikif uh, if i could ask you when you, when you when you talk about uh, projects like Like, uh, like these, you know, like uh, 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 J. J. Thomson when he came up with the discovery of uh, electron, mm -hmm. and then the Queen of England uh, asked him. He said, well, "Who knows? You might just tax it one day." Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> when it comes to the economics of neutrino, mm -hmm. are you really hopeful that in terms of uh, generation of money or maybe making faster buck, in terms of those things, neutrino could be uh, could be helpful in, in any way? Well, let me first tell you about the use of neutrino that we know we could. Put it to maybe okay. not now, but in a few decades, okay. and which is, for example, for nuclear non-proliferation. Okay. See, the property of neutrino that we just heard about is mm -hmm. that it's very weakly interacting. Okay. So it passes through everything. Okay. Which means that it's impossible to hide neutrino. Okay. okay. If we are able to now develop technology to develop to detect neutrinos efficiently, mm -hmm. it means that after a few decades or so. No country in the world, absolutely not, no country will be able to make a clandestine neutrino a nuclear reactor okay. or a nuclear That's weapon. Very because wherever you make it, you can't hide it. Somewhere okay. else will detect it. Right. Permit. There is another application, for instance, that this neutrino could be put to, and that is to do uh, prospecting of uranium and thorium. In okay. fact, about maybe 15 years ago, there was a paper by one of our ex uh, colleagues, uh, Professor Raghavan. and uh, that said that you know if you had a few 10000 ton detectors a few places in the world you could tell what is the uranium thorium distribution okay in the globe that just cannot be done any other way okay No, but uh, is it true that uh, where, where is exactly develop? using the same property that right. neutrinos can so, penetrate anything? So, which means the nuclear reactors also would be a source uh, for neutrinos. They are very useful, actually, sources. Yeah. 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 Useful, actually sources. One of the key parameters has been discovered that way, has been found to be non-zero. Okay. In fact, we the neutrinos were first discovered yes. using neutrinos from a nuclear reactor. Okay. In 1956. Okay, okay. And in fact, this uh, what uh, Naeem was talking about: uh, particles and antiparticles, right? Actually, the sun emits neutrinos, right. and reactors produce anti-neutrinos. And it was during this process of discovery that you know they actually realized because what do you mean by an antiparticle of a chargeless mm. object, right? right? I mean, he said proton plus antiproton is minus, but neutrino has zero charge. Right. Whereas you know plus zero or minus zero are the yeah. same. so to understand really already what it means to have mm. an anti neutrino was very difficult and it right. actually came through understanding that right. the particle emitted in the sun and the particle produced in the reactors are two different things right but uh, another very big source uh, of neutrinos are the supernovas which everyone is uh, talking about uh, how much of research has actually uh, uh, gone forward I mean, you have asked the right person to okay. be an expert <laughs> in uh, supernova yeah. neutrinos <laughs> okay so i'll ask professor dikhi <laughs> on this so um, uh, how much of really of the forward movement has happened when you talk about the supernovas as as becoming the most important source of neutrinos see mankind has been observing supernovae for thousands of years we have okay. records from the 10th century and so on okay, okay. however Uh, neutrinos on the supernova and supernovas yeah. if you have to bring it to the language of the common man is nothing but the explosion of the big stars so no? big star yeah okay. so big star explodes okay. in fact it explodes because neutrinos push it from inside okay okay, okay. that's and interesting so they play a large role in exploding that <laughs> right maybe before going there i take you a small thing about uh, supernovas huh. all the iron that we see on the earth okay has actually come from the explosion of some supernova which happened somewhere okay okay, okay. so we, we, all hemoglobin that we had that right. we used to actually absorb oxygen right. uh, has come from the explosion of a supernova mm -hmm. so mankind has known about supernova for many many years right. however the first time we detected neutrino from supernova was in 1987 which okay. is very recently when right. we built neutrino detectors mm -hmm. now whenever we look at stars or even the sun what we actually see is the light coming from it right. and therefore we look at its surface okay 
light cannot tell us what happens inside the core of the star because the light cannot pass through the star. Okay. Neutrinos allow us to see what happens inside the core. Okay. Actually, what nuclear reactions happen inside the and sun? Only the core of the stars, the core of the sun. Yeah, and everything. Okay. So to understand inside of the sun, we actually need neutrinos. Okay. And similarly about supernova. Okay. okay. Now as I said, how a supernova explodes also tells us about how we came into being. Okay. okay. Uh, so the new nuclear, uh, new neutrino detectors that are being built are built such that they are efficient in detecting neutrinos that will come from a supernova. Okay. So when a supernova will explode, okay. about 10 to the power 58 neutrinos come okay. out in 10 seconds. Okay. okay. So that's whenever a, something like this number. will happen in our galaxy, right. we are now sure that we will see thousands or ten thousands of them in our detectors. Right. And from that we will be able to actually know how stars explode. Which is one of the big mysteries. And for uh, any forward uh, movement know. now, as far as the supernovas is concerned, of course you've got to wait for the next supernova to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Yeah. everyone is waiting. Everybody is waiting. Yeah. Typically happens in about once in 30 years or so. Once so it's yeah. about the overview for the neutrinos through which you know that a supernova explosion has taken somewhere. So you can even alert the optical astronomer all around the world that a supernova explosion has happened there, look at that direction right. and after some time they will see it right. is light. Yeah. Uh, in fact, in come about a day before the actual right. light comes, so yeah. we know where to look. I would come to you, uh, uh, Professor Datar. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's something of a, uh, a huge interest. Uh, we, we've seen in our uh, childhood uh, serials like Star Trek we used to see interstellar communication happening and so uh, I've read it somewhere that probably neutrinos could help us uh, uh, in building that kind of a communication. Is it true or is it just probably a fiction? Well, at this time I think it is uh, more in the realm of science fiction. Okay. But what you think is science fiction today can really happen. But some kind of a research has already taken place as far as yes. the communicating signals so is concerned. So hundreds of kilometers is what has been achieved now. Okay. If you want interstellar, that's that's a much, much taller order mm -hmm. because you have to have much higher energy accelerators. Okay. You have to have PEV or something like that, okay. which is, uh, you know, orders of magnitude However, higher. However, that hundreds of kilometers already is good mm -hmm. because if you want to send communication by light, it has to go via satellites. Okay. It has to actually go around the earth. Okay. Yeah. Neutrinos can go through that, the earth, the so they yeah. actually will reach faster than the light okay. can reach. So, in fact, it's the faster than So, on the lighter side, the stock exchange broker in Tokyo will get information from New York through a little earth. faster the earth. than, yeah. <laughs> and that is not through the satellite, and can, but through the can make his decision, which can help him uh, make some more money. It really sounds like a science fiction, but who knows? It might become a reality because, as they say, today's science could become the technology of tomorrow. Thanks to all my guests, it was a pleasure for uh, to ha to have all of you on this program. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.